I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, incredibly interesting topic, ethical capitalism. Is it worth a try? Uh, and I think just to set the scene a bit, the last 30 years have in many ways been the triumph of capitalism. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, I think, wrote it was the end of history when the uh, end of communism came, and it's been the triumph of the capitalist system. It's had dramatic successes, a billion people lifted from poverty, the share of people living on a dollar a day has gone from 42% about 30 years ago in the world to about 14. Dramatic strides in poverty alleviation. At the same time, there are big problems. You don't need me to tell you that. Inequality within countries has widened dramatically. More, around two-thirds of people in the world live in countries where inequality has widened. Most of Europe, the United States, China, India, big, big income gaps as we've seen the gains from growth going overwhelmingly to the top of the income distribution. We've also seen more obvious ethical challenges, whether it's cronyism, whether it's corruption, whether it's disproportionate gains to a very small group of people. So those are the kinds of subjects that I hope we're gonna look at this evening, and I hope we're going to say, is there something we could do better? And if so, what? And if so, who should push it? So those are the questions I'm posing to this panel, which is a spectacularly interesting panel. Um, people from many different uh, walks of life to address this question. I think you have uh, a note of who the illustrious careers of everybody on the stage, so I'm not gonna go through that. It would take the next hour and a half. Um, but just very briefly, Stan Bergman, chairman and CEO of Henry Schein in the USA. Next to him on his left, your right, Jasmine Whitbread, chief executive officer of Save the Children. Here, Peter Brabeck, chairman of the board of Nestle. Mohammed Yunus, now chairman of the Yunus Center, known to all of you as the founder of the Grameen Bank. Here we have Martin Sorrell, uh, chairman of WPP. In the I'm so sorry, a mere CEO. <laughs> Very unimportant person, a mere CEO. <laughs> and finally, Ignacio Visco, governor of the Bank of Italy. So you have uh, from the economists to the businessmen to the charitable sector, all manner, uh, all sides of this debate, if you will, represented. Stan, let's start with you. What are, in your view, the most important ethical challenges that modern capitalism faces? Are there any? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm 100% committed to the, no the notion of free markets. There's nothing inherently bad about capitalism. If we take a look at what's happened in the last 200 years, 200 years ago, 85% of the world's population was in abject poverty. Today, it's 16%. You can debate those numbers, but the trend is that way. Profit is not a dirty word. The free markets work, generally, and strong economic growth can deal with practically every issue in one way or another. Having said that, capitalism is only as good as the capitalists. The bottom line is that capitalism has to be rooted in ethics. Just like doctors have to be ethical, business people have to be ethical. Just like government officials need to be ethical, business people need to be ethical. It's not the system that's the issue, it's the notion of ethics. You know, uh, the uh, cardinal, uh, Turkson, pr made a presentation on behalf of the Pope at the opening of the uh, uh, Davos uh, uh, World Economic Forum. And he said, humanity is served by wealth and not ruled by it. And I think the bottom line is so much of this ethics issue runs to that. At the end of the day, it's the constituents in society that make capitalism work or not. Business leaders have to take a long-term view. The culture of business, specifically for public companies, is short-term view. The issue is investors need to take a long-term view. They can't be short on long-term they need to be long on long term. The bottom, bottom line is that governments have to make sure the rules are fair and governments need to ensure that there's a level playing field. We don't need more government, uh, we do not need more government, we need good governance. The bottom line is if investors do this, if government does this, if businesses leaders are ethical and that, at the end of the day, public-private partnerships, working with not-for-profits is a terrific way to balance the ethical aspects of society. Can I just ask you, and I'm going to get to everyone else, but how do you, how would you rate your fellow businessmen then on those criteria? 
<laughs> you, you, do you mean do you no, mean no? No, I don't mean the panel. I mean broadly. The I mean, people on the panel are has, great. Okay, put it more concretely. <laughs> has has business become less ethical recently, in your view? Well, I think you know. Over the centuries, we have seen spurts where greed has over been greater than necessarily the balance of moving society along versus the profits that drive business. I think that has been the issue, and this is a cyclical situation. I believe that in, I at the end of the uh, early part of the uh, 2000s, we were in a period where greed was a little bit, not a little bit, a lot out of balance. And I think there were a lot of business people, and I would say in the financial sector. And I think government had a lot to do with allowing this greed to continue. The challenge with government at that period was that the rules were, I think, basically okay, specifically in the United States and the UK and a couple of the other developed countries. But there was a lack of oversight. So I think unchecked governance leads to greed, being excessive, and I think that breeds the wrong people at the top of many companies. So I wouldn't paint uh, uh, all <coughs> business people or the percentage of business people uh, uh, as greedy or being bad, but I would say that where there's a lack of governance and government oversight, this allows for these bad things to happen. Now, the long-term issues, and Stan mentioned it, it's a big problem because we're all evaluated trying to run listed companies, not private companies so much, but listed companies, were all evaluated on quarterly performance. I agree with Stan 150%. That has to change if we're going to get change in attitudes. But all the stakeholders, whether it's your employees, whether it's your customers, your suppliers, the government, NGOs, journalists, trade journalists, whatever it happens to be, will be best served if you take the long-term view. And the... Some people call it a crisis in capitalism. <clears throat> the challenges that we face, which we discuss here in Davos, and, and we've been encouraged this year to talk about the long-term issues, inequality, uh, the, the health, welfare, youth unemployment, which is scandalously high, particularly in Western Europe, in countries like Spain, where 50% of the youth are out of work. And you know that statistically... If a young person is out of work in the early part of their career, their lifetime earnings are crushed. So this has big social, political, and moral consequences in the, in the long term. Jasmine, you listen to this, um, for particularly from the corporate side. Do you think that uh, the right problems have been identified? Well, I mean, I'd just like to sort of go back to some of the basics here. Um, I actually agree with a lot of what has been said. I disagree with some points as well. Maybe we'll come on to those. But, you know, back to your opening question, uh, uh, Zani, about you know, what's wrong with, with capitalism at the moment. Um, I mean, I would just point out three things. I mean, I, I would highlight again the point you started with around inequality. I mean, most every year now for the last, you know, five, six, seven years, all the participants at Davos who are polled um, as to what their top concerns are. The rising up the agenda in that concern, it used to be sort of a concern number five, and, 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 and it's now number one, is inequality. The big challenge is how to redistribute. So redistribution, I think, is, is the big challenge. And at the same time, education. Education means to find the jobs that the future will give us. Uh, ten years ago, nobody of you would think that we'll come here with this little uh, iPad that uh, that uh, you are playing with, uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm playing with it whilst you're speaking. Uh, <laughs> okay, but you know this is uh, creating a lot of new jobs, opportunities, and so on and so on. So we have to make the rules of the game uh, beneficial for for all to find a future. No, I think the whole question is, uh, first of all, the word ethic per se is a relative word because ethics always refer to a certain society. So when we are talking here in this room about ethic, we are talking basically about our values of a Christian, Protestant, or Catholic environment and the ethic of this. Now, if we would be sitting just today in Saudi Arabia, the ethic and the values would be completely different. 
That's the first thing. It's a very, this is a very, very important aspect. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have many times such a confrontation uh, as Western Europeans, for example, with Chinese or with uh, Japanese or, or, or with, 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 with the Muslim community because we have different ethic ideas. Can I just push you on that, though? Is capitalism, which did, you know, in some sense originate, or at least the, the idea of capitalism, if we go back to Adam Smith, is it, is it, is it inherently situated in the, the Western ethic, if you will? No, capitalism per se, and I, I think Stan was absolutely right. Capitalism is not ethical or unethical. You can make it depending on, first, how you exercise it, and secondly, into which value scheme you put it. Okay? I think that was then said very clearly from the beginning, and I fully agree. So, uh, as I said, I do agree with a lot of what has been said, and I don't think there's an alternative to capital. And I don't think in capital, I completely agree. There's nothing inherently good or bad about capitalism. Um, and in fact, capitalism has, you know, economic growth has lifted millions of people out of poverty. Well, I just mentioned in general about the ethical part of it, because that's the discussion going on. I think essential of capitalism is ethics free. It's not based on ethics. We, it, we can put ethics into it. If I'm a Muslim, I put my Muslim ethics into my business. If you are a Christian, you put your Christian ethics if you want to. But you can do business without putting anything in it. If I'm ethical business, for example, I would like to say I shall not do any harm to any people. That's my ethics. That's where I imposed it. Business didn't want it. I shall not do any harm to planet. That I put ethics. But it's ethics free. I shall not get involved in corruption. That's ethics. I shall not do any deception. That's ethics. So if you want to talk about this, this is not the one that you can impose ethics. You can say that you have to have some ethics. You can have a kind of general consensus over it, or you can do it as an individual. So here's the story. The 85 wealthiest people in the world is not the issue. I mean, you could debate some aspects of it. The issue is that there are, there's inequality and there's a lack of access to basics for millions, uh, probably a billion people, you would know that. So, capitalism without training wheels does not work. Capitalism needs training, uh, training wheels. So, we speak about unemployment. Actually, the problem with unemployment, and I think there's going to be a challenge in the developed world, and particularly in the US, I don't think we're going to get below 5% again. Why? because we don't have the right educated workforce. So we have a, a huge imbalance in the United States. We can't find programmers. The immigration authorities are limiting the number of programmers allowed into the United States. So regulation is in the way. What we need to do is turn out programmers, and we need to turn them out in the United States, and then we won't need the regulation for the immigrants. So the bottom line is we can't have it just Capitalism needs its training wheels. Companies should not only be assessed by earnings per share. Companies should be assessed by some form of su sustainability index. This, c this concept is well defined, but instead what we find the, the SEC and the, uh, uh, agencies like that doing is just putting more and more regulation, more forms to be filled out, instead of looking at the right things. You can't regulate crooks. If they're going to exist, they're going to exist. You can't stop them, but you can make sure that the right metrics are looked at you can make sure that board of director members are not only judged as to whether they ran huge, successful financial institutions, but whether they're able to develop a good culture in a company. So I think, in one way or another, the whole notion of the free market, the capitalist environment, needs training wheels and not more regulation and not a, 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 a way in which, at the end of the day, the system of capitalism is attacked, but rather we need to give it some training wheels to get a more balanced methodology in place to reach the needs of society. Uh, I think that obviously we are very much concerned about uh, uh, mass poverty in the world and the difficulty of living with one dollar a day and so on and so on. And it is, we may say that there's been improvement and certainly has been improved in the last 20 years, but we are far away. But is this because of capitalism? Or is this because of other things? Or do we think that capitalism will help us close the gap? I don't know, but um, I I, I, perhaps yes. I would say that this has very much to do with other isms, imperialism, colonialism, and, and things that in the past have led us here. Now, having become 
more prosperous, we are worrying about these things more than we have, were in the past. So capitalism has helped us really to realize that these are very serious issues. But I don't think that we're saying that um, you know, it's capitalism's fault. I, I think what we're saying is how can we, if we're moving on to what the solution is, how can we work with the capitalist system that we've got, because it is the system that we've got, and we can argue about whether... But, you know, and I think it has had many benefits. And how can we m help make it work? What needs to happen to make that system work to have even more benefits and to address some of these concerns that we all, to a greater or, or lesser extent, feel e exist? We run a uh, uh, microcredit program in uh, New York City. There are six branches of Grameen America. <laughs> We have over 20,000 borrowers in the last five years that we started. 100% women. Average loan is about $1,500. Interest rate is 15% in a declining basis. And we, make, uh, uh, we cover our cost. Uh, we reach our payback period and so on. So this can be done. And we have done it in Bangladesh. I didn't give the example of Bangladesh. It's, oh, Bangladesh is a different story. So I'm giving example of New York City. And that's where we want. Repayment rate is 99.4%. No collateral, no document, no uh, lawyers pouring over anything. But it works. It works. Now it is expanded in several cities in the United States. I th <laughs> Grameen Bank, to me, is the model company. You have used the free market. You've used capitalism to do good. There's a whole movement starting up of what's called higher ambitions companies. These are companies with a sense of purpose that is beyond returning profits to shareholders. I, for one, have a company, yes, we're in healthcare, where I've said formally to our shareholders, Henry Schein does not exist for the shareholders. We agree to provide a good return, rate of return and it's been a very good one. We've actually grown our shareholder value, our, our market cap, by 23% each year for the last 17 years. But we exist for more than simply the shareholders. We exist for our customers, who happens to be healthcare providers, and we want them to run a better medical, dental, or veterinary practice. We deal with our suppliers. We want them to do very well with us. Our team and the communities they're in, we want them to do well. Our investors, we want them to get a good rate of return. But actually, the secret sauce at Henry Schein is our social responsibility. Where, like you, we have been able to align, align our interests with societies. And I would say that companies that do that do very well. And there's a good amount of information now, Harvard Business Studies, Babson Studies, that show that companies that align their interests with society generally do business a better business and better returns than those that don't. So I, instead of ending capitalism or controlling it too much, I think we should look at what works. But and Grameen uh, Bank is the perfect example. That, and you, what you know is that, that every chairman and CEO is, is not greenwashing anymore, espouses as a core part of their strategy the social objectives. And by, by the way, in to, in, to maximize your return, I would argue if you're long-term, Yes. And you take into account yes. the stakeholders. You know, the economics is the yes. result yes. of good behavior, whether it's less enlightened capitalism or less selfish capitalism. Absolutely oh. agree with you. I think the degree to which this has moved, specifically since 2009, yeah. is enormous. But doing the right thing is not about issuing a check to a charity. Of course, yeah. that's important, and that's mm -hmm. important to sustain NGOs. But it's important to work with the NGOs. So if you're going to give money to care, get involved in the board. Get involved. Your whole company will be different if you can engage your, your team. And I think that's how you advance yeah. uh, society. But being honest about that and, and addressing it, none of us are perfect. I think, you know, stakeholders will support that. So I think that is the bit that is quite unusual. That's one. The other one is actually using your core business to make a change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite obvious with a healthcare business, you know, you could think about it's, how that applies easier. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. easier, how yeah. that applies to the Millennium Development Goal to stop, mm -hmm. you know, women and children dying in childbirth, et cetera. Um, I, you know, I, I can imagine, Martin, how you would, you know, want to use oh. your core, core competence in communications and in growing markets, actually, and, yeah. and reaching the, the bottom of the Which pyramid. Which we do do. Um, you know, but, but I think 
fi finding those examples is, is still not as common as, but I think we're making great progress. Well, I would start where Yunus left us. He said capitalism is ethic free. That means, in other words, that any company that wants to exercise its activity has to put itself a value system to the capitalism. You, you cannot have a pure capitalism. It doesn't exist. It always needs to have a value that surrounds it. Now, this value will depend on where the company is, what the history of the company is, and things like this. But this is the most fundamental issue. Therefore, if we are looking into a company, for example, for acquisition, before I look into the balance sheet, I look what is their business principle, mm -hmm. what, is, what is their value proposition. And if this value proposition cannot fit with the value proposition of Nestle, we will not make an acquisition. The, the millennials as a generation, the, the latest generation, really have, are changing the way, I mean, they, they absorb a lot, I think, of the philosophy we've heard. And the fact that they are espousing good causes, uh, uh, trying to not be as selfish as has been pointed out, is a big, uh, is a big factor. Because companies, in order to prosper, will have to embrace a very different philosophy. So uh, that point, and Martin's point, 100% right. The younger generation wants to be, uh, get engaged with companies that want to make a difference. Right. And I would submit, five, six, seven years from now, it'll be impossible to hire the cream of the crop. In fact, I think really the only way to solve this issue that we're talking about, these societal issues, is through public-private partnerships. And the biggest issue, I think, is we have to teach people how to fish and not give them the fish. Of course, if they don't have fish to eat, of course we need to do that. And if I were a young person, I would get engaged in public-private partnerships. What I would go, I would do, I would find an NGO that works for the company. I would go meet with company people that are engaged in social responsibility. I'd pull the politicians in. I would find a way to make a difference through public-private partnerships that in the end can teach those that don't have the resources they need to live to catch fish. And at the end of the day, I will say to business leaders around the world, if you are not changing your culture in your company to be engaged in societal issues, you will not attract the best talent. And at the end of the day, business needs talent. And without the best talent, you will not succeed and create shareholder value. Uh, my, generation, my generation is a generation who went to school, to university in the late 60s, in the mid 60s. And I have to say that uh, I chose economics because I thought it was a good way to do something good, to change the world. And a lot of people of my generation did that. Then uh, 70s, uh, 80s, 90s, the mood changed. We are uh, in, at the swing of the pendulum. I think we should capitalize on these young people. I, I think actually it's part of the same phenomenon, actually. I mean, exactly the same, is that in order to get balance and not to be just totally pursuing financial criteria in the short term, you broaden the index, you broaden the evaluation system, and you, you, you make sure that it permeates the whole structure of the organization. So in a way, I think what you're suggesting is the same but on a national level. I mean, how you measure that happiness index as an economist. I'm a right. failed economist. You're a successful one. Uh, how you measure that is very difficult. I mean, richer society as ours is, at a certain point there, there are some trade-offs, and we should uh, consider with care. Trade-offs like environment, trade-offs like uh, uh, altruism, the ability to be happy because others are happy, the uh, culture, uh, there, there are really a large number of things that uh, really are, uh, may at times be discriminated because of an excessive value given on income. But I think this is not a major macro issue. This is not to create the massive employment that we need. 
uh, overall the rate of change of GDP and the rate of change of uh, GDH more or less go together. Economists uh, probably didn't pay attention to that other part. That's why they didn't uh, develop those measurements. Uh, they, in order to make their life simple, we cannot give up our life. We have to design those things so that we can measure what is happiness, how we measure it. If we pay our attention, we'll definitely find a way to do that. And this is one issue which comes back again and again between selfish business and a selfless business because selfish business can be measured in terms of money, how much money I made, as how much profit I made. The more money I make, the more happy I get. There's a measurement, one-to-one -one relationship. I said, making money is a happiness, it's true. But making other people happy is a super happiness, but nobody <laughs> measures it. We don't have a happiness index in my company, but what we do is every two years, we do a culture survey. Everyone in the company takes a survey, and one of the items in that survey is, are you happy with the company's social responsibility? And it gets amongst the highest ratings on that culture survey. The bottom line is, I think, if companies are socially responsible, the team really values that company, wants to get involved with that company. Grameen Bank was successful because your employees were proud of what they were doing. And I think that's a key driver in advancing uh, shareholder value and at the same time economic wealth in society. Thank you. You know, I, I know there are so many more questions and I'm very apologetic, but I also know that the organizers will be very cross with me if I go over the witching hour. Everyone has things to do. Let me thank the panelists. I'm not even going to try and summarize this discussion. It was extremely rich. I think we did come, come up with many uh, challenges, let's say, if not problems, ethical problems, ethical challenges in, in capitalism, or whether it's the system or the people. There were some interesting uh, ideas for solutions, and I think for me, two really things stood out. One is how much is happening within companies, and two, how much we're going to rely on the millennial generation. <laughs> so with that, uh, I leave it to all of you who are in the millennial generation to improve the system uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much.